Okay, welcome everyone to the I2B2 Transmark Foundation community meeting for February 2018. Uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone. I'm the VP of Marketing, and I will be uh, leading the, uh, the session today. Today's agenda, we're going to have uh, a couple of guest speakers. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about the June meeting at Harvard. We have some updates uh, there. Then we'll learn about uh, loading genomic VCF files into I2B2. And then we have a uh, Bill Hayes from the Open Bell uh, group will be giving us an overview and update on Open Bell. I just want to remember that um, this is the, the foundation. Our real focus here is the community uh, and expanding the, the use of the, the various platforms that are part of the foundation, which today is Transmart. I2B2 and Open Bell, and trying to encourage and do what we can to foster usage uh, of the platform. <clears throat> Wanted to first talk a little bit about our June meeting at Harvard. Uh, this will be the third year that we're uh, running this meeting uh, in uh, coordination with the DBMI uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we do have an events working group that I uh, show here on the screen that uh, works to, to pull together the various events um, and uh, do a lot of activities behind the scenes. Uh, if you have interest in working with us, please let me know. Uh, we'd love to have more participation here. Uh, this year, the Harvard Symposium will be on Wednesday and Thursday, June 27th and 28th. Uh, it will be held at Harvard Medical School. Uh, at least the first day will be at the uh, usual location at uh, Louis Pester, um in a building uh, in the rotunda, and um, we, we may or may not stay there the second day, but it'll be close by if it's not there. Uh, we do this, as I say, in, in uh, cooperation with the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School uh, and work closely with Zach Kahani and his team. Uh, Zach will also be running his usual precision medicine uh, program, Precision Medicine 2018, the day before on the Tuesday. Uh, and so it gives a very nice three-day venue uh, to come and uh, participate in these three days. Um, this year, we're going to try a slightly different format. Uh, the format uh, will have day one, which will have more of the formal session with presentations. Uh, and the focus there is going to be on the, uh, the use and importance of the platforms, uh, some uh, a bit about the history uh, and uh, use cases, uh, and then also maybe looking towards the future. Uh, we're going to try to, to have... Uh, uh, several uh, interesting speakers, uh, as well as time for some good discussion as we go through that day. The second day, we're going to focus on breakout sessions, and these will uh, include working groups, uh, the various foundation working groups on user interface and ontologies, uh, et cetera. Uh, also, some topics of interest in open source architecture, uh, integration tools, and uh, talking about, for example, Picture, uh, which um, Paul Viak has, has been uh, designing and using as part of the I2B2 Transmart project. Uh, we are planning to run a hackathon on one, one or more topics uh, that could be of interest. Uh, and then uh, concluding with a couple of sessions on looking towards the future, where do the platforms uh, need to go next and, and what sorts of planning uh, and activities should we be uh, looking at. Um, Zach has been working very closely with us. Zach's the chairman of the board of the, the foundation and has personally been working with us. Uh, he'll give a kickoff presentation at the meeting on that day one. Uh, we also have Eric Praxilis, who will speak about the beginnings of Transmart uh, at Johnson Johnson, as well as his efforts uh, at FDA um, and uh, his new company, uh, Datavant. George Church um, is, is planning to come by and then give us a, a talk about uh, uh, his leadership in open source software and open data for genomics, and also to get some uh, some idea about what he sees the future uh, of, of genomics and, and you know, working through open source software. Uh, John Halamka, who is the former CIO at Harvard Medical School, is going to talk about his efforts uh, in health data in the health data exchange in Massachusetts uh, and getting, um, you know, pr trying to bring data into uh, much more openness and, and shareable forms uh, for the community. And then Paul Viak will be uh, certainly showing us uh, the first versions of the ITB2 Transmart platform, as well as talking about uh, his program there. Um, the, uh, the events working group uh, is working to uh, put together day two of this agenda. And as I said, uh, we really encourage anyone who would like to participate and help us plan these two days. Um, please let me know or contact someone in that working group. 
Uh, we think it looks like a very exciting day. There'll be a lot more details coming in terms of um, registration and hotels and things. And uh, certainly stay tuned for that. The events working group is also working on the fall meeting, uh, which we're planning to have in Europe this year. Uh, it's going to be similar to the last year's meeting in Paris, which was the I2B2 Academic User Group meeting in October, that the foundation um, worked with them and added a few sessions from the foundation side. Uh, this year, we're hoping to have a, a joint meeting uh, somewhere in, in probably in, in Central Europe, and we'll see, um, you know, trying to get that pulled together. So hopefully within the next month, uh, we'll be able to give you some more details about that. So uh, presuming that's going to be in October of 2018. So that's what we've been working on from the foundation side. Uh, this has been our main focus, um, really, these two meetings. And um, we'll uh, certainly have more information in the next uh, coming days. OK, so now we'd like to, to turn this over to, um, to the I2B2 team. Um, we have um, uh, Janice Donahue and Nick uh, Watasson, who are going to speak about um, adding genomic VCF files into I2B2. And uh, Janice, do you want to do an introduction? Sure. Uh, thanks, Rudy. Um, basically, I think most of you have heard uh, my name around, or I know all of you probably know Mitch Wadanasan. Um, basically, all I'm going to do is just basically introduce Mitch because Mitch and his team have done a lot of great work around um, some of this stuff with. Uh, that they've done with the biobank um, team here at Partners Healthcare, in which they've done some great work uh, around the genomics. And they basically, in release 1709, we released uh, some enhancements in the web client you may have seen and, and weren't sure how you could use that. And basically, the custom value chooser hand, hand <coughs> excuse me, handling. And <clears throat> what that is, is we changed some things in the back end behind the scenes with how um, lab values, you could customize the window and you could do some things with it. And for the most part with I2V2, eh, you, could, you could use it or you didn't, but where it really comes in handy is with some of the genomic stuff. And Mitch is going to go show you uh, some samples of how you could do that and what they've done um, and it's just basically an introduction um, some of the examples that he's given he's going to show you today and I'm going to basically turn it over to him at this point and what you're going to also see is hopefully later today um, there'll be some documentation available on the wiki and also there'll be a link from the itv2.org site that will get you to the uh, documentation where the samples will reside <clears throat> so, Mitch, if you want to take it over from here and show what your team has been working on, that'd be great. Great. Thanks very much, Janice. And thanks a lot, Rudy, for the uh, opportunity to uh, to discuss and, and introduce this year. Uh, so, basically, um, uh, just like Janice said, I'm uh, one of the core developers on ITB2, uh, mainly maintaining the web client right now. And I'm also involved with other I2B2 related um, portals at Partners. So one of those portals um, is called the Biobank Portal, and it's an internal uh, Partners only project um, right now. But it's essentially it's it's, uh, it's a web based query tool that allows investigators at Partners to uh, essentially query and download data um, about consented uh, biobank subjects here at Partners. So um, that means that they can make requests. They can essentially use the I2B2 interface to make requests for um, for plasma, serum, DNA, and also genomic data. So we made um, uh, genomic data now searchable in the biobank portal for 15,000 genotyped uh, patients. And so based on this work that we did um, for in the internal um, biobank portal, we wanted to contribute uh kind of an example on all the kind of the implementation that we did uh back as a community project uh to i2b2 so for this first slide you can see it's just talking about a community project overview um it essentially extends uh 
uh, to be to query functionality to provide the ability to um, query uh, essentially by uh, for genotype subjects by specific uh, annotations um, of genetic variants. So uh, what Janice mentioned is that either today or tomorrow we're going to be putting up a package um, off of the community wiki site but it also be available I think it'll be linked off of attribute.org slash software and essentially it's it's going to contain um, just a starting point and, and and it's kind of a working example of our local implementation of what we did and just to go over these bullet points um, we're providing uh, the source code for the ETL um, process that we wrote to convert VCF files into um, I2B2. I'll, I'll talk later in a, in a couple minutes about that. Um, we also uh, have, we have, have a lot of documentation on how we're representing that the variant data in I2B2 um, SQL scripts to uh, show essentially just demo data, uh, a, few, a few genes and a few um, subjects that you can load into your demo instance of I2B2 to kind of kickstart, get it working. And um, an example, I2B2 ontology uh, with uh, the lab value metadata, which I'll um, briefly discuss. And essentially a uh, web client new uh, lab value handler um, that will allow you to kind of capture you know, this kind of genomic query uh, in your I2B2 web client. So again, this is you know, there, there's so many ways that, that, that one could implement this at, at your local site, but this is just, um, you know, an example of how, how we, we got it working on our partners. Um, so the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so as part of our, our ETL process, um, I think many are, are, are already familiar with, with the variant call format. It's a, it's, a, it's a text file format it's called VCF to store genetic variations and, and essentially contains information about positions in the genome. So uh, we receive these files from <clears throat> the genomic teams, um, part of the Biobank here at Partners, and uh, we get them into um, essentially one uh, VCF file per patient. and we wrote a .NET program that extracts, um, and essentially goes through this ETL process to to load the e uh, VCF files and, and their patients into I2B2. So this is just kind of a screenshot of, of uh, there's not a very good UI, but uh, it does the job. And, and uh, this is also part of the source code that we're releasing as, as, as an example. Um, specifically, our VCF files are from the Illumina multi-ethnic genotyping array, um, but again, this is you know this is a lot of a lot of variation in in, in kind of the approach. Um, so just the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the data representation here is. Um, Pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, we we decided to uh, load the variant data um, in as new facts um, for the patient tied into a a con concept um, in ITB2, such as SNP and INDO, and, and I'll kind of go over that in, in the ontology slide in, in a second, but. Um, so this variant information is actually put stored in in the observation blob uh, section, as as you can see here. So these are just kind of five example rows, and this observation blob, um, uh, essentially this this string here, is the example that you can see up above where it says RSID. So there's like an RSID uh, and a reference to alternate, and then et cetera. So this, this, these are the if if they don't have those annotations, it would say missing consequence, et cetera. But these are put into the Austrian blob so we could utilize um, already existing I2B2 um, searching features, which, which is in the next um, couple slides, 
to kind of just uh, leverage the contains and, and uh, searching in I2B2. So we don't have to kind of change any of the server side um, implementation. Uh, the next slide, please. So the next slide we have um, ontology rep representation. So um, in this little, on the top right there, you can see kind of how we set up the, the, the tree uh, kind of, you can either drag over the SNP folder and search by RSIDs or drag over the gene folder into the query tool and you can search by gene. Um, the kind of the crux of this, of how this works is that um, behind each folder or, you know, or one of the leaf nodes in the ontology tree, uh, we populated the value metadata XML. So, for those familiar with, with how I2B2 um, lab values work, you would have this kind of snippet of XML uh, that kind of describes, you know, some of the lab value. This is where you would define your high lows for that lab, et cetera. So um, we're kind of using this thing to essentially tell the I2B2 web client that, um, hey, you know, when you drag over um, one of these special types of concepts into your query tool, you can see, uh, you know, you, you're going to see a, a, a kind of a custom screen that, that will capture additional uh, <clears throat> uh, metadata for your query. So uh, an, an example here is just, this is just what the kind of the value metadata looks like um, for when you drag over SNP. It has the data type there as genetic variant SNP. And this will tell the web client uh, to pop up a specific box that we we wrote up for this. So this is also um, part of the package that we're going to release as open source just to show how, how this is done. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to continue with that, um, so this is what the uh, custom value chooser looks like when you drag over um, the DB SNP uh, search by RSIDs. And so um, as Janice was alluding to um, in the beginning, uh, we rewrote in 1709 uh, the way that these custom uh, lab values, and, and it's not really for lab values but anymore, but just kind of the custom value handlers in the web client works. So we we rewrote it in 1709 um, in the web client, but we didn't really uh, have a full documentation on it yet. And so this is kind of going to be released as part of this, and, and also probably additional documentation will go up on the wiki on how this works. Um, but nothing is different from the older versions of, of the web client to now that you would see, that you would notice um, when, you, when you look. So when you drag over lab, um, you know, of, of a type text or of, of type enumerated value, you will still see the same screens. It's just the way that um, you can now do custom handlers um, very straightforward. Um, so what that means is that if I kind of, just an example that, that I like to give is when I, um, if I created an I2B2 and I just kind of had, threw my data in there and I wanted to have an arbitrary concept of shoe size, you know, it's, that's just like a, a property of, 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 of the subjects in, in my I2B2. Um, essentially, what I, I would be able to do is I can create a concept in the ontology called shoe size, and I can create, you know, populate that value metadata XML, and I could label it um, kind of shoe size in there. And in the web client now, there's a new folder um, that allows you to capture the handler. So I can kind of just paste in or copy and paste in a new handler and I can call it kind of shoe size handler. And as long as, you know, the, the, the lab value metadata XML um, identifier matches up with the handler, which is a JavaScript handler that I've dropped in, into the web client, it will pop up that custom box up. So as you can see, in the previous slide, I, we, we tagged it with um, kind of genomic SNP RSID. 
or variant and then when you drag over that that essentially calls the um correct custom metadata box to to be put to 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 be displayed so in this um screenshot here you can see that we kind of just asked for two things and this is again just just you know what we wanted in our um for our users kind of just to keep it simple uh you can kind of search by RSID. We have this RSID um, uh, field to be, uh, what is it called, uh, an autocomplete. So when you start typing the RSID number, it will come up with kind of a list of RSIDs, et cetera. And we actually have that uh, autocomplete example also as part of the package um, that, that we're going to release. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So essentially when somebody on the previous slide kind of types in their RSID and then they, you know, they selected that they want heterozygous, homozygous, or, or kind of all the properties or misozygosity, um, what this translates to, and again, the, the reason why we moved it, uh, why we use the alteration blob is just to be able to reuse the contains um, value operator in I2B2 using the value type large text. Um, that already exists in I2B2 for searching. So essentially when you capture the appropriate query from that custom metadata uh, or custom lab value chooser, um, it formulates this query in the back end in I2B2 um, already as standard. So it would, you know, select your patients where, um, you know, modifier code, et cetera, et cetera, value type equals blob, then the last two lines of that SQL statement is where it contains, and then it's just putting that RSID that you entered in that autocomplete um, plus any of the other properties that you checked off. And this does a contains SQL um, search statement, I guess, uh, against the observation fact table uh, for the on the observation blob. And um, just to mention, not in the next slide, so just to mention here is that um, we took the approach that since, of course, there's a large number of variants that we have to add into the observation fact table, um, there's um, a great number of rows, obviously. And so we took advantage of um, the work that Lori Phillips did when she released the um, the OMOP project for I2B2, it's essentially using um, multi fact tables in uh, in I2B2. So you can have kind of you can kind of split up your you know depending on when you're loading your data, how many patients you're you're loading. Um, you can split up your number of patients. For example, we have 15,000 patients. We can do 5,000 um, patient loads at a time um, into three separate fact tables and then using the multi-fact um, features in, in I2B2, which, which is actually already available. Um, we can tie those queries together when you're, when you're dragging over you know, the folder inside, uh, when you're dragging over the, the folder into the query tool, into a query panel, that query panel formulates a query that goes out to all the um, multiple fact tables to search on that. And uh, just the acknowledgement slides, there's just, of course, I'm not <laughs> the only one, I'm not even the main person, but there's a, there's a lot of people involved um, that made this work possible from both the Biobank portal team and, of course, the ITVP team. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a question, a couple questions actually have come through. Um, I'll just read them off and then they can uh, add. So Jim Campbell from the Nebraska uh, says, uh, nice work. Uh, we've also been loading genomic data into I2B2 and felt that we needed to support phenotype of the tissue being analyzed, the somatic versus germline observations, uh, as well as appending the pathologist assessment of pathogenicity. Have you dealt with any of that in any way? That's a great question. Uh, uh, let's see. 
I haven't personally dealt with this, but um, I can actually forward your question to someone on the Biobank portal team. They're they're away this week, and um, you know, I, she wanted them to be part of the presentation to answer some of these more um, um, <laughs> complicated questions. But uh, I can definitely get back to you, Jason, on that. Okay, and well, so we'll I'll forward that to you, and we can follow up on that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay. That's another question that I can see is um, given the string representation of the parent data in the observation plot is querying fast on a large set of them. So, um, great question. Uh, so we've only dealt right now um, up to, up to this date with 15,000 patients, and I forget how many billions of rows that we have. Um, the querying is is actually pretty good. I think the such the, the kind of the the um, the large work right now is kind of to make sure that the indexing and of, of the table is, is being uh, being created um, both correctly and, and we're running into issues when we're kind of moving on to larger sets of patients now. Um, but we're working on that something to do with um, the partitioning and the fragmentation of the actual table. Um, so far, it's been fine. I think that if we use the multi-fact approach and kind of keep the tables smaller than um, just putting them into one observation fact table, um, it's been working great for us for over a year. And now we're just um, kind of moving on to a larger set of patients. Uh, I think the target patients is 50,000 year partners. So, um, and hopefully we do want to put in some kind of Perform, not performance metrics, but the kind of statistics of, of what we found, um, kind of the number of facts that we put in, into our implementation here. Um, I want to put that on the wiki also, just so we can have kind of have some real life uh, uh, kind of uh, something to look to look at to, see, to evaluate and compare. Okay, um, can you provide a sense on how the VCF data scales VAX performance? Related, maybe. How? Uh, uh, how it scales. So I guess I don't remember exactly how long it took to load all the VCF files, but it was quite a large um, amount of time. Oh. Um, this was, uh, and and I don't want to kind of just beat anyone by giving some yeah. wrong uh, numbers, but I was just remembering that um, a lot of it had to do with kind of just network connectivity issues and, and kind of the first time we've we've done this, but um, uh, it wasn't that bad, but it still took like kind of a, a few weeks to load the data um, into the into the fact table. Okay, and then Aaron says he thinks your last question really answered this. Your last answer. Okay. Okay. And so Ward Ward has another question on the dimensions of the variant querying. Uh, how many Five thousand. Um, yeah. How many patients? Yeah, we I have, guess he's so we we've been working right now with fifteen thousand patients. I don't remember what the exact number of variants. Okay. Uh, it was a very large number. I just yeah. So I'll I'll post some of this some of these statistics um, up on the wiki when when we get it um, working this week and right. um, you know we can definitely circle back if, if you have any questions. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and as I said, we this is all being recorded and will be available, um, in a, and hopefully in a day or two. All right, thank you. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you so much. Okay, now we're going to go to our last topic for today. Um, William Hayes is going to give us an overview and update on uh, Open Bell. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Uh, can you yeah, make the presenters so I can? I, can. I hope I can. There you go. <laughs> Should be there. You should have the option now on your screen. Um, so you have to accept the presentation. Yep. 
Okay. okay. And okay. looks good to me. Okay. Great. Um, so this is really more of a news update than any particular deep dive into any aspect of Bell. And uh, I was actually heartened to see how many different groups and uh, companies, organizations are actually providing Bell type services and infrastructure. So this doesn't include some of the other companies like uh, Clarivate Analytics and Ingenuity, which is actually providing their content in a Bell format. Uh, it just included the ones that I was aware of in the last uh, year or so that have something new. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of these logos and uh, company names that you see. Uh, but you know, first, for those of you who are not familiar with Bell, what is Bell? Why Bell? You know, what problem are we trying to solve here? And if you look at chemistry and chemists, they've had a language to talk about chemistry that is unambiguous. Uh, it is succinct, and it is also computable. Uh, you can capture a set of uh, chemical reactions and pathways and incorporate that into a computable format that you can then analyze and process. What's the biological version of this? If, if so far, there are a few attempts at capturing biology in a standard format, such as Biopax, uh, System uh, Biology Markup Language, SVML, and Bell, uh, the Bell Expression Language. But we none of them really taken over. And one of the limitations around Bell becoming this lingua franca uh, way of biologists capturing knowledge and sharing it is just platform infrastructure support, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but not having the standardized language that we can use in biology has really been very inhibiting. We Biology is all about networks, all about uh, interactions. And our standard approach is putting those into a PowerPoint slide and sharing that, or describing them in journal articles, but or maybe putting an image of a, of a network or a series of interactions uh, in that paper. But you know, we make good databases about genes, proteins, uh, RNAs, uh, things like that, anything that is kind of a straightforward database, we do fairly well in biology, but capturing the knowledge of what these different biological entities mean and how they interact, uh, that's something that we haven't done a great job yet in biology. So uh, the goal is with Bell uh, to make, provide a language that biologists can use, which succinctly and easily captures the concepts uh, that we need to in biology and capture them in a way that is easy for people to read, easy for people to write, but is also in highly computable. We can take that, we can convert it into a uh, computational format for that, that is easy to analyze and easy to process in a graph structure. So here with the what is Bell, uh, the PubMed abstract or a part of a PubMed abstract is being used here to extract out the fact that IL-6 increases um, the ENO1 um, protein. And it also increases the XBP1 protein. So a couple of issues in biology are, how do you name things? How do you have a, a name that is unambiguous? And the approach on Bell has been to put a prefix on it, like this HGNC uh, colon that you see. So the HGNC is a prefix that stands for Human Gene Nomenclature Committee. And we also have namespaces, which are represented by these prefixes for SysProt, Go, Entree Gene, um, MGI, RGD, uh, sorry, Rat Genome Database, Mouse Genome Institute, uh, the Zebrafish uh, Database. So there's a lot of different name stations that we've started collecting. Uh, and these terminologies are important as namespace values in a functional format. And we have both an abbreviated 
as well as a long form uh, version where you see the P parenthesis, that's the functional protein abundance of uh, IL-6, and then the long form version where you spell out protein abundance uh, with parentheses. And then it's with the relationship with the RNA abundance. Uh, you also add annotations so that you understand the experimental context or the context that this biological assertion was created from. And on the next slide, this is kind of a very quick, you know, I, and I'm, I'm blazing through what is Bell and, and how do you represent biological knowledge in Bell. Uh, but it's, it's very much focused on this functional construct where you may have uh, protein abundance with the target of that protein abundance being AKT1 with a modifier. Uh, in this case that you see next to the function parameters, this means a protein modification, uh, a phosphorylation event at position 308 in the AKT1 protein, um, which impacts the threonine residue. The, and one of the nice things about Bell is it's actually very, very simple uh, conceptually. You have functions, which can contain functions, uh, namespaces, and strings as parameters. And that is pretty much the entire syntactic uh, set of rules around Bell. Now, there are definitely a lot of semantic rules as to what kind of functions can be embedded in other functions and what kind of namespaces based on their entity types. Are they a protein? Are they a disease condition, uh, pathology, uh, et cetera? Uh, that can be in embedded as particular parameters of different functions and as well strings and what kind of uh, strings can be in a particular uh, parameter of a function. The assertions that are represented by these um, subject relation object um, constructs are gathered together in what are called Bell nanopubs, which capture the different assertions from that particular set of contacts, the citation that it was extracted from, and a summary text, uh, the evidence kind of where we saw that PubMed article that was an extraction from the PubMed abstract that was particularly relevant to the assertions that are contained in that nanopub. Uh, the annotations, which are the experimental context, and any metadata about the nanopub, such as the creator, the updated time. Uh, this nanopub is captured in a JSON format, which makes it very flexible and easy to work with. And we've kept the restrictions on what is absolutely required for a nanopub to be fairly limited, um, which has the advantage of being it's a simple format that's powerful that you can capture a lot of uh, knowledge in it. But the downside is it's not as structured, so you may have trouble interpreting some of the information that's put in there. Uh, but the core concept is a Bell nanopub is a curated, uh, manually curated set of assertions or knowledge about a particular aspect of biology. And we'll talk about how Bell nanopubs can then be converted into a computable format uh, later. This is kind of that example. Uh, this is an example Bell workflow. And you start with a nanopub saving it into a nanopub store, then you can create edges uh, and store those. And the edges are essentially that fully connected graph that is generated from a set of manually created assertions. And you don't want biologists to create every possible permutation of the uh, biological knowledge that they're generating. You want, you want to generate that in a more automated fashion. So adding in things like backbone edges, uh, gene is transcribed to um, RNA, RNA is translated to protein. You don't want to have to have biologists put all of that information in manually. Uh, that comes in as a separate stream as part of the Bell pipeline uh, listed here in the create edges node. And the, um, 
once you store these edges, now they're available for various analytics because you have a fully connected or as fully as is possible connected graph uh, that can be processed. And you can use it for things like causal reasoning where your knowledge, your prior knowledge as represented by Bell is mapped to measurable biology such as uh, RNA-seq and DNA-seq uh, and protein expression data. Uh, and you can take the RNA expression values and the find the ones that significantly differ up or down after a perturbation, and then look upstream to see what causal effectors uh, may cause a certain subset of RNAs to go up or down. And that allows for uh, kind of what we call reverse causal reasoning, or what we referred to as reverse causal reasoning at Sapenta. The there's there are quite a few papers on how to use Bell for various analytics and mapping this prior knowledge in Bell with data, uh, because Bell was originally created in, uh, over 10 years ago, actually probably at this point about 15 years ago by Dexter Pratt at Genstruct, and then Genstruct was renamed Solventa about five or six years ago, they open sourced Bell as a language, but it's over the last couple of years since Solventa shut down, the language has uh, languished a bit, unfortunately. Uh, but once you have the edges in the edge store, not only can you use them for analytics, you can also extract out edges from this edge store. And the edge store represents possible biology. When you filter out a subset of these edges, uh, into a network, now you're kind of instantiating it into a hypothesis or a view of um, realized or actual biology. When you say, give me all of the edges for lung cancer in human um, stage four. Uh, when you pull out all of the edges from the edge store for those particular conditions, now you're looking at a particular aspect of biology that's more real uh, as opposed to possible. And if you can further filter it down to a specific cell or cell line, now you're looking at what's actually happening in, in human that has been extracted across multiple experiments, multiple papers, multiple databases in one view. So that's one of the advantages of having this edge store of possible biology with uh, strong context and citations is you can easily work with it to pull together uh, nice hypotheses of what's going on using more real biology. So that was kind of an overview of what Bell is and, and how you use it. Uh, the news for the last year, uh, OpenBell has been pretty quiet as far as any work or support for the OpenBell platform, OpenBell API since Authentic closed. And as far as I know, and since I'm one of the people that helped support it, it's largely unsupported at this time. It was designed to handle a lot of legacy capabilities and designed for the enterprise. And it is difficult for a volunteer open source community to support it. Uh, Fraunhofer Sky has been moving forward with their projects in both Belief, which is a text mining platform, uh, and a couple of things that they have been working on recently is PyBell, which is a Python library for working with Bell content, more at the researcher desktop level, uh, especially in network analysis. They have also been doing a lot of work in, and have a uh, large GitHub repository for collecting OpenBell resources. So these things like uh, Bell namespaces or converting databases into uh, Bell content that can be used in a uh, edge store or what the old Solventa form of it was called a CAM, um, a CAM knowledge base. The Cytoscape Consortium has kind of engulfed the Index project. Uh, Index supports Bell networks natively, uh, along with other types of networks, and you can find out more about that at Index Bio. Uh, BioRelate is a company that provides AI-backed curation of content into Bell. And if you need to have 
targeted Bell content created, or uh, if you want to engage them to create a large database, knowledge base of Bell content, I highly recommend talking to them. Uh, Eric Newman is developing a deep learning uh, approach using prior knowledge based on Bell or Bell knowledge. Uh, he hasn't released his product yet, but the company is IDACA. Uh, if that is intriguing to you, please contact him, or if you don't have his contact information, please let me know and I'll put you in touch. Some big news is we are finally getting back on track with gathering Bell interested parties together. We have the Bell Community Conference coming up May 14th uh, this year in Boston. It's the day before BioIT World really kicks off. Uh, they have some tutorial sessions, but the next day is when the first sessions of BioIT World start. It's sponsored by CHI, who puts on BioIT World, patients like me, as well as BioDaddy. And if anybody's interested, we would love to have you come. I'll be sending out an evite in the, hopefully next week or so, uh, with the preliminary agenda. Uh, I will be putting that on our OpenBell discussion forum, as well as our OpenBell Google announcements list, um, or send me an email if you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, if you're not currently on those lists. Bell.bio is, and I'll talk about this more, has been launched in January last month. Uh, it's an attempt to revamp the OpenBell API in a format that is easier to work with, easier to deploy, and uh, a bit lighter weight than the OpenBell API. And BioDaddy Inc. has been created to provide support for Bell.bio functionality, as well as provide additional Bell commercial tools and provide support for uh, maintenance, things like uh, providing Bell namespaces and converting databases into Bell. And Hopefully, we'll be announcing that in the very near term, the BioDaddy Studio. So the Bell community meeting, the goal is to really reinvigorate the Bell community. It's been languishing for the last couple of years. Uh, the major supporter, funder of a lot of Bell work or Bell infrastructure was Solventa. And when it shut down, we didn't really have a home for supporting Bell at that point. And there weren't a lot of resources available. Um, that is changing now. Uh, the location will be in the waterfront rep, one room of the Seaport World Trade Center. Uh, it's a free conference, uh, thankfully, thanks to our sponsors. And uh, we expect to have updates from the community with demos and deeper dives into what's going on. One of the key things that we are really interested in doing is starting to evolve the language again. The Bell 2.0 uh, version of the language that was defined about three to four years ago, and we're just now getting that Bell 2.0 functionality delivered in a usable format. But one of our goals was to make the language much more uh, evolvable, dynamic, supportable, different version. So we're really looking forward to seeing what new aspects of the Bell language that people want to insert. Uh, we already have some ideas around population abundance to support adverse outcome pathways for toxicology, and there's a lot of interest around genetic and disease orientation uh, for the Bell language. So I mentioned Bell.bio, uh, and it was launched uh, for feedback last uh, last month. The goal was here was to get rid of some of the legacy weight of the Open Bell API. Um, use and one of the lessons learned from the Open Bell API is don't push a Ruby platform in the bio community because there are very few bio Ruby is available, especially and pretty much none in the Bell uh, community. The we have struggled for many years in a an easy to understand vocabulary around Bell and there was a lot of variability. We've since refined the language. Uh, we talk about Bell assertions for subject relation objects and focus on 
you know, components, very clearly defined individual components uh, around the aspects of Bell, such as nanopods for curated content, the edge store for the transform compiled curated content into a fully connected graph, and a network store. Uh, and the network store purely uh, is filtered network from the edge store. Uh, we have much better Bell and Nanopod validation, better error messages, better completion support for building Bell statements. And we have focus on making it very quick and easy to add new Bell versions, language features. Uh, it's based on Python and Docker, and it's very quick and easy to start out with a simple Docker Compose app. Uh, so I won't really, I think we're pretty much running out of time, so I'm not going to go into the details around the different stores, uh, if you want, or the namespaces. We currently have about 23 million terms, the 24 million terms that we're managing in the 21 namespaces. Uh, something I'm very happy with is our completion time is about 15 milliseconds, which makes auto-completions much more functional. This is a list of additional resources. If you want to find out more about any of the things that I talked about, as well as there are links spread throughout the presentation, which has been shared with Rudy to share out with everybody that's joined. And I'd like to say thank you. And I'm looking forward to providing a lot more support and engagement for the Bell community. Okay, great. Thanks, William. Um, any questions? I don't, uh, none have come in, but um, if you would raise your hand or if you uh, type a question to the question panel, um, I'm sure William will be happy to answer it. I, I will add this um, the, the session to uh, the, the foundation website as well. So Keith is asking what happened to the knowledge bases that Selventa had? <laughs> I, uh, they were sold, and so Philip Morris International has one set that they can share, uh, that they have rights to be able to share, uh, that has been confirmed by me. The other, and that was historical, uh, and they're in talks about how to commercially license that. Um, there, the rights to the original Solventa knowledge base were sold along with the Solventa IP. I don't know, can't say who or what their plans are for it, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks, William. That was very good. Um, Thank you. Uh, I will have this posted in the next uh, day or two, I hope. And um, along with the, re the recording, so we'll be able to, um, everyone will be able to, to review this material. And uh, hopefully some people will get to, to come to BioT World and actually join in in the, your session. Uh, we certainly hope, hope to be so. there as well from the foundation. Okay, so uh, I'd like to just, um, I, we'd like to uh, open it up for any other questions from anything that we've covered or other things today. I know we've uh, gone long today, but I think the, hopefully the uh, content was interesting to everyone. I don't see any other questions, uh, so, um, Guess with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we will be back uh, next month with our next session. Thanks everyone.